before, but if you're visiting, we do want you to know that you're certainly welcome at East Hill, and we'd encourage you and invite you to attend every service that you possibly can, and again, if you're looking for a place to place your membership with the Lord's Church, I can highly recommend the East Hill congregation and their eldership and their leadership. I want to thank you again, first of all, for your joint participation with us and our work at World Mission Radio, and we'll probably have a little more to say about that and the situation there, maybe after our service today or sometime during our services today. The scripture that was read this morning in Acts chapter 8, very familiar passage. The excitement of Pentecost has ended. The first Christian martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. And now there's great turmoil in the Lord's church. Saul of Tarsus, who had not at that point been converted, bringing havoc upon the church, causing men and women to be bound and cast into prison. And the disciples were scattered abroad, everyone except the apostles. And in that text it says that Philip the evangelist, he was the evangelist, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Have you ever wondered what Philip may have preached? Have you ever thought about what all is embraced in preaching Christ? I want to share some thoughts with you today in regards to the thought, preaching Christ. A number of years ago, while teaching at the Great Commission School in Nashville, the late brother Willie Cato, one of my great, great friends, was also one of our teachers there. Brother Willie was speaking at the devotion, the chapel hour on one occasion, as I recall. And he said he had a friend once who had been at a congregation of the Lord's Church, a preacher for a number of years. And it was time for him, he felt, to relinquish his position as a pulpit minister and go some other direction. He said he had been there so long that he had seen several of those in the congregation that were born during the rain and time that he was there, saw them grow up, attend school, watched them graduate from high school and go to college and university and later perform wedding ceremonies for many of them. A lot of those that he saw grow up and so forth, he helped to teach and to baptize. And he also said that, of course, he had uh, officiated over many funerals during his time and reign there in the congregation. And so he said, I began thinking, looking back over the years that I was there in that congregation, said, I got to thinking, what could I have done that I didn't do that I should have done? And he said, after I gave a lot of thought to it, I came to the conclusion that I should have preached more Jesus. You can't get too much Jesus. And so when Philip and the others began to preach, and when they preached Christ, they preached Jesus. First of all, when you preach Christ, you preach the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the good news, the death, the burial, and resurrection, if you please, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 at verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, but necessity is laid upon me, and woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 at verse 2, Paul said, I have determined, past tense, I have determined to know nothing among you save Christ and Him crucified. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you kept in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you how that Christ once died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, the thesis passage of the book of Romans. We may look at some things tonight from the book of Romans. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith unto faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So when we preach Christ, we are to preach the gospel and nothing but the gospel. The Bible warns us and teaches against those who would teach a different doctrine or something other than the gospel. We find, for example, in 2 John verses 9 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, John said, those who teach a different gospel, Receive them not into your house, neither bid them God's speed. For he that biddeth them God's speed is partaker of his evil deed. Paul writing to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not adhere, adhere sound doctrine, but of their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meat which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving to all them that believe and know the truth. No wonder then the Bible places a great deal of emphasis on not only preaching the gospel but knowing the gospel. Knowing the word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. It was Job who said in the long ago, as is recorded in the book of Job, chapter 12, verse 23, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And then the psalmist said in Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. In Psalms 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The gospel then is the greatest news that's ever been told. And so when we preach Christ, we must preach the gospel. And again, as Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, Paul said, I have no fear in preaching the truth. I have no fear in preaching the gospel anywhere, anytime. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, or 17, rather, Paul said, What I teach in one church, I teach in every church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, he said, What I ordain in one church, I ordain in every church. And Paul also said, as he wrote to the church of Galatia, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, that is the inspired apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed or anathema, which means to be done away with. You know, the Bible very seldom repeats itself. But on this occasion, Paul, by inspiration, felt it necessary. And so he said, as I said before, 
Let me say again, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be a curse or anathema, which means to be done away with. And then we come down to the last book in the Bible, to the last chapter in the last book in the Bible, to the last few verses just before the last amen in the last book in the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, and the final warning from our God is, don't you add to, nor don't you take away from my word. It's important because on the day of judgment, when you and I stand there, and we all will, we'll be judged by what's written in this book. John chapter 12, verses 48 through 50. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that will judge him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but of the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that His commandments are life everlasting, whatsoever I speak. Therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak, my friends. Jesus said on the day of judgment, when we stand there, we will be judged according to the things that are written in this book, in His Word, which is the Gospel. Jude said then, in Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful that I write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered once for all, for all time, for all people. Not that emphatic in the English, but it is in the Greek. Once delivered for all time, for all people, nothing else needed. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According as God has given to us, according to His divine power, hath God given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Peter said, you can take this book, you can learn from reading and studying this book, obeying the commands of this book, you can learn how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life and go to heaven by this and nothing else. Therefore, who's me? If I can go to heaven by what's written in this book, then I don't want, I don't desire anything else. When we preach Christ then, beloved, we are to preach the gospel, the saving message of the cross. Only by obedience to it will we be saved eternally. And those who have never named the name of Christ, never put on Christ in baptism, never had uh, their sins washed away, never have obeyed the gospel, have no hope of eternal life when this life is ended upon this earth. We must preach the gospel. But when we preach Christ, not only do we preach the gospel, but we also preach the authority of Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the gospel, but it is authoritative. If you'll notice in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, And they believed Philip's preaching in the name of Jesus, the things that he was doing in the name of Jesus. That's by the authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 28, It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. At the end of the first recorded sermon of our Lord, the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, at the conclusion of that, this people who were listening to him, his audience said, we recognize that this man is different. He speaks with authority. He speaks differently than those to whom we had been listening. He had authority in matters of religion. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John upon the mountain. There he was changed or transfigured before them. And in the vision, Peter saw in the vision the prophets of old. And he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. You see, he made the mistake that people often do today. Put in men, even though prophets of old once had authority in matters of religion, but placing them on an equality on the same plane as our Lord. God spoke from heaven on that occasion. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud 
overshadowed them, and behold, a voice from out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. No longer listen to Moses who once had authority in matters of religion. No longer listen to Elias or Elijah the prophets of old who once had authority in matters of religion. But now Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, has authority in matters of religion. Even Moses said, as recorded in Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, and Moses truly said unto the fathers, The prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall he hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Ephesians 1, and 23. And hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who had sons raised time and diverse manners, spake in time past by the fathers, whom he had appointed heir over all things, by whom also he made the world. No longer listen to the prophets of old. No longer listen to those who once had authority in matters of religion. And then in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All power or all authority is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. All authority, not some, not just part, not a little bit. In matters of religion, Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, has A-L-L, -L, all authority in matters of religion. That eliminates then the possibility of anyone else having authority in matters of religion. I don't have any authority. The authority that we have is in this Word, in His Word, in the Bible. No one else. So when we preach Christ... We preach the authority of Christ. When we preach Christ, we also preach the deity of Christ. Yes, He is divine. Yes, He is God. Yes, He is the Son of God. But He is also God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God, who is God when he came to the earth, he was God in the flesh. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Put the emphasis where John did. And the Word was God. You ever looked at the New World Translation? Translates, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. Any kind of God you want to make Him. Big God, little God, true God, false God. Any kind of God you want to make Him. But the article A is not in the original language. He's not a God. He's not some God. John said He is God. And in verse 14, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word word there is not the English word. It's not the spoken word. It's the messenger, Lagos. He is the messenger from God. And while here tabernacling in this, in this earthly tabernacle, he was God in the flesh. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Being found fashioned in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was God in the flesh. He couldn't stop being God. He couldn't quit being God. When he came to the earth, he was born of a virgin, prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and also Isaiah chapter 9 at verse 6. Fulfilled as we see in Luke chapter 2, but spoken of in Luke chapter 1, when the angel made that, made that announcement to Mary, said that Holy One, that One who is God, will be brought into the world by you. So he was God and man at the same time. We have to know that Jesus is 
divine. I want to turn with you now. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn with me to the book of Colossians. I want to deal with just one passage. I could quote the passage, but I want to read the passage to you. In Colossians chapter 1, at verse, well, I'm in a different Bible. Uh, Look at verse 13, beginning. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Talking about Christ. Verse 14 is what I want to just look at. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Notice Paul said he is the image, that's the Greek word icon. The word icon means the exact image. He is the same thing as Jesus said to Thomas, when you look at me, you're seeing God. I am the same, the same as you see. The image, the icon, the exact image, no difference between me and the Father. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. There are those in the religious world who do not believe that Jesus is divine. They believe he was a created being and that he was the first thing that God created. And they go to that passage and we need to read on, but we don't won't do so for time's sake, but they'll read that passage and they'll say, see, Mr. Jones, the Bible says that he was the firstborn of God's created things, the firstborn thing that God created, or the first thing that God created. So he was the first of God's creation. Has nothing to do with him being created because he wasn't created. The word firstborn comes from the Greek word prototokos. And the word prototokos simply means he is before. He is the preeminent one. He was before all things that were created. Because if you go on and read, it says by him were all things created that were created. Doesn't mean he was the firstborn or the first thing that God created. He was firstborn in preeminence. In regards to firstborn... Moses referred to Israel as God's firstborn nation. But they weren't for, Israel wasn't God's first nation. When Israel was infant, Egypt was ancient. And so don't let anyone confuse you. Don't let anyone try to convince you that Jesus was a created being from that passage. And then they go to Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. And in that passage it says that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Again, they'll say, as they point to that verse, if he was the beginning, then he was the first thing that God created. has nothing to do with him being a created being because he wasn't. From him came all created things. Like water from a spring. From the spring, that's the source from which we get the water. Christ was God in the flesh while he dwelt here upon this earth had to be in order for him to come and pay the atoning price for our sins. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. No one else could do it. But Jesus said, Father, I'll go. I'll go die in their stead. I'll pay the price for them. And he did willingly on Galgotha's Hill over 2,000 years ago, halfway around the world. Jesus climbed up Galgotha's hill that day with you in mind and with me in mind and said, Father, I will go. I'll pay the price for their sins. No one else could do it. And he couldn't do it. My beloved, unless he came, tabernacled in the flesh. That's what he did for you. Salvation is a free gift. Paul says in Romans 3 verse 23. But it's not without cost. He paid the price. He stands before you today, if you're not a Christian, without stretched arms, saying, Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. Matthew chapter 11, verses 30 through 33. By believing that he is indeed who he claimed to be, the divine Son of God. Repenting of your sins, Acts 17, 30 and 31. At the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, and whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. There's the resurrection. There's the proof. Confess him as the Lord of your life. Surrender in obedience to his will and to his commands. By putting him on in the water grave of baptism, by being immersed Buried in the water grave of baptism. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, You will arise from that watery grave a new creation. American, new American Standard Translation says. Created as it were all over brand new again. All those past sins are gone. Like dropping an old shabby coat or garment at the door and never putting it on again. His invitation is yours today. If you need to respond to heaven's invitation in any way, we bid you come while together we stand and sing. Will you